Yeah, aloha and welcome back to Energy 808, the cutting edge on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today on the show, we'll be discussing the Aloha State Energy Roundup with our guest, Marco Mangelstorf, guest and co host and contributor. Welcome, Marco. Uh, let's, start Hello. With, let's start with what you mean by an energy, Aloha State Energy Roundup. Well, you know, run them up little doggies, right? Remember back to our far west days and, you know, cowboy incarnation where you get these stray cattle and they, uh, they would go out and have to round up little stray doggies. So there are no shortage of stray doggies no, that, uh, that you and I, because this is the first time that toi and moi, you and I have been back together again, just the two of us. So it feels very, very intimate. Very sweet, very, very nice to be just back the two of us. Not that I don't appreciate our other guests, they're all fantastic, but you know, when all is said and done, it really comes down to Jay and Marco. So thank you for having me on. Thank you, Marco. Um, we get great information and we keep current on things that are happening in energy in Hawaii, which we need we need to do. This is the place to keep current on energy in Hawaii. Well, the first thing on our long list, and it's a long list, we're moving on. Um, is an update uh, from the legislature. For example, there's a bill in play to reduce the state solar tax credit, and that's being advanced by Senators Glenn Wakai and Donovan de la Cruz. What's the bill, and is it good? No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, from my perspective, Jay, you know, my selfish parochial perspective, right? And, you know, what, what's interesting is there was, uh, when, when this legislature started in January, right? There was great concern about this massive gap between expenses, you know, expenditures, right, and money coming in. And then lo and behold, the American Recovery Plan was passed by uh, Biden and the Democrats in uh, the House and the Senate in Washington. And it's as if everybody, so many people across the country, you know, whew, what a relief, right, especially municipal government, state government. So we're getting a bunch of money, always getting a bunch of federal money, right? They can print money, they can send it to us. So there's much less of a squeeze from what I can tell compared to a few months ago, right? Much less of a squeeze. That said, there is a bill on the Senate side that would reduce the amount of tax credits for uh, film production. As you probably know that we've been uh, pandering to film crews to come over here and film and giving them tax breaks and all sorts of other wonderful benefits, right? Uh, because anytime you see whether it's Magnum PI, Hawaii 5 fill in the blank, fill in the blank, stuff filmed in the Hawaii, it brings more tourists in, right? So part of this and they, bill- and they would, tend to spend a ton of money when they come here. Correct, correct. So let's give them a little bit of the money back after they spend a bunch, right? Mm -hmm. And then the other part of this particular bill would also reduce the renewable energy technologies in, uh, investment tax credit. I would kind of stumble on that. It's renewable energy, investment renewable energy tax credit <laughs> okay i give up okay, and i think we got the idea we've we've had a form of this solar tax credit now for <clears throat> excuse me at least 45 years 45 years and that has allowed hawaii to become the most solarized state in the country on a per capita basis and it's not even close to any any other states on the u.s mainland so from time to time, there are efforts to cut down on the tax credits. So lo and behold, now we're well into the session. The session is about a month or so to go. Uh, two senators, Wakai and Dela Cruz, uh, have put this bill into play, which would reduce these two tax credits for motion, for, for film and for solar. So interestingly, you know, our friend or my friend, uh, Rep uh, Representative Nicole Lowen, who's in uh, the state house, and who represents the uh, part of the west side of the Big Island, she hasn't even seen this bill. I mean, she's seen it, but it's never gone through her committee. Why? Because it started on the Senate side. So, you know, Nicole, I think, is going to do whatever she can, said that this bill does not pass as is. Uh, with the nub of it being essentially that you've got some individuals in our legislature, in this case, Senators Wakai and Dela Cruz, who are uh, pushing a bill, who are favoring a bill which would. Uh, turn the investment tax credit for solar in half. It would cut it in half. I, I don't recall the timing uh, in terms of when that would be, but you know, it goes to, to the fundamental question really. Number one, uh, is a 
renewable energy solar tax credit still necessary in the state? To which I would answer yes, given the fact that we're still 80%, Jay, 80% dependent on imported fuels. And second, if you buy my answer for question one, is it still, still the good thing to do? Then the question is, do we tinker with it? Do we leave it as is or do we reduce it? Do we, do we ramp it down over time? And it's my opinion, and I think in the industry in general, is that now is not the time to ramp it down. Now is not the time to, to start bringing down that tax credit. There's another consideration too, Marco, and that is that the more money uh, that uh, people spend on solar, the more economic activity there is in the state, and the more that builds the solar in industry. Um, and so, and I say that because I, I think it's important in these days, these call it um, trying to get out of COVID days, uh, that we incentivize the development of our economy. Um, both of these things do that. And so to knock down the credits knocks down the incentive effect on both of these credits. And that's really too bad. By the way, um, Nicole Lowen's gonna be on the show in a few days. We can ask Excellent. this. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's, that's really interesting, but why, you know, why would uh, senators, um, you know, advance bills like this? What, what reason would they have? Is this to save money when we don't need to save money? I can't speak definitively for either Dela Cruz or Wakai. Uh, I don't know either of the gentlemen personally. The hit I've got from Wakai after kind of tuning into him over the past couple of years, and he, by the way, is the chair of the Senate Energy Committee. So it used to be my friend, uh, Senator Lorena Noe, but she's now transportation. So you have Wakai, who's chair of that committee. And you know, my impression is that Wakai represents the line of thinking, which uh, I understand. I've been hearing it for on and off for a number of years. In fact, our friend Nina Marita is also kind of of this line, which is that you know, by and large, these tax credits uh, tend to favor and tend to benefit the more higher income earners and also companies from out of state who are able to somehow monetize the tax credit and that it, it is not fair and equitable and doesn't uh, necessarily benefit the lower uh, ends of the economic uh, strata. And therefore, if it is more of a uh, tax credit, a tax Benny for the more affluent, then it has that kind of populist, you know, progressive feel to it. Well, let's go after tax credits that uh, you don't really need because it's mostly rich people who, who benefit from them. So I may be kind of oversimplifying, but I think my hit is that Wakai has some of that energy, that attitude within him. When you talk about Mina Marita, you know, the, uh, the view that she's expressed a number of times is, uh, you know, if the economy wanted to have solar, it would, solar would develop. If, if the, you know, the way to develop solar is organically, um, that is a, as a natural process, rather than with government incentives. I, I personally don't agree with that. I think if you want to change people's conduct, if the economy is not developing in a way that you want, as a matter of policy and planning, then you can uh, you can nip and tuck it. Uh, you can incentivize uh, or de-incentivize certain activities, and presto, you can change those activities. Um, it's only a question of uh, you know being clever in the incentive. Well, Jay, I mean, uh, the risk of sending like a broken or scratched CD. You know, I've been saying for years, and I'll say it again, there's no such thing as a level playing field when it comes to energy in terms of subsidies. And I noticed with great uh, satisfaction that uh, President Biden's uh, infrastructure package, which is still, of course, a big work in progress and will continue to be a work in progress for a while, that it, it according to some of the reports I read, uh, it would ramp down the incentives, the tax incentives, the federal tax incentives to fossil fuel, let's call it dirty fuel uh, sources of energy. And I think that's nothing short of fantastic because if you look at the actual numbers, Jay, the actual numbers going over decades, the large preponderance of subsidized, taxpayer subsidized incentives whether tax credits, whether other parts of the tax code, heavily, heavily, heavily have heavily favored 
coal, oil, coal, nad gas, and nuclear, with solar and renewables being a manini percentage of what I just said. So the notion but, that, oh, well, I mean, solar should survive on its own. Yeah, sure. Take away all the subsidies to all energy forms. I'm 100% down with that. Once they all go away, once the others go away, the ones for solar should go away. But in the meantime, it's not competitive for solar as long as big oil, big coal, big nat gas continue to get the subsidies that they have received over decades. Oh, like that's, that's, you know, it's, that's a gross flaw in the way things have worked over decades. They don't really need incentives. They don't need subsidies, but they have you know, the power of big capital and lobbying, and they have achieved yeah. that, and they hold on to it, and they spend a lot of money holding on to it every year. So um, yeah, I, I, I agree that, uh, that those Biden did the right thing, is doing the right thing. I hope he can get it done, that's all. Let's move you on. Know, just, just to riff on that for one more moment, you know, purposefully, nobody in the Biden administration that I can tell is calling it anything like a Green New Deal, right? Oh, that's to uh, uh, AOC, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, right? No, 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 it's not a Green New Deal. But if it looks like a duck, it walks like a duck, it talks like a duck, it sounds pretty New Dealish to me so far, whatever you call it, so. Uh, and a number of, a number of uh, opinion writers have made that exact conclusion. Yeah. That it, it may not be called the New Green Deal, but it has many of the elements that AOC was asking for a, a year ago. Good for Biden. I mean, he's, he's achieving important things to, to improve, the, improve the energy picture in our country, among other things. So, okay, uh, let's talk about uh, Hu Honua, one of our favorite topics. Uh, oral arguments are scheduled at Supreme Court on April 22nd. What's at stake and what's the likelihood? Uh, what's at stake? Well, uh, you know, and uh, it was thanks, uh, thank you, Henry Curtis, for bringing this to our attention. It just, you know, is it coincidental that the Hawaii Supreme Court scheduled the oral arguments on Earth Day? Earth Day, which goes back to, I think is 1970, and one of the original Earth Day founders, the guy by the name of Dennis Hayes, I actually know Dennis, mm. uh, and it's just amazing that now, what, 50 years later, you know, we're still celebrating Earth Day, so interesting that it's being argued on Earth Day, and you know, what's at stake is whether Huhanua, which would burn biomass at a ridiculously exorbitant price to Helco of 22 some odd cents a kilowatt hour over a 30-year power purchase agreement, uh, whether that plant is dead, 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 finally dead, never coming back dead, or whether the Supreme Court were to rule, were to rule against the Hawaii PUC and said that the PUC uh, ruled in error to reject uh, Huho Nua's proceeding to want to move forward with the power plant. So what's at stake is a Hawaii Supreme Court, five justices, who will decide whether a state agency with quasi uh, judicial powers and a substantial amount of, 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 uh, of power and prerogative, right, and discretion, whether the Hawaii PUC was incorrect in rejecting the, the, the project by saying, and that, that what they hung their hat on was the commission hung their hat on last year, was that uh, this, this PPA is essentially null and void, which was agreed passed by Randy Awase's PUC several years prior is null and void because of a lack of competitive bidding. That was where they hung their hat, legally hung their hat. So uh, my prediction is that, okay, we'll go out on a, on a little limb here, a mango limb, is that the, the court will rule uh, four to one or five to nothing. I'm gonna go five to zero, five to zero in favor of the PUC correctly deciding and that that will be the end, at least in the state court system of uh, Jenny Johnson, Franklin Templeton, who knew his efforts to bring on board this abomination of a biomass burning power plant, not that many miles from where I'm sitting right now. And why does this sound like a point spread thing? Uh, <laughs> I, think, I think you're probably right within a, a point or one or two. <clears throat> but uh, let me let me offer this thought and see your response to it. You know, some would say, and I'm sure who would say, look, we 
we got into this, we spent last time I looked 95% of, of, of our budget on it, it was hundreds of millions. So we spent, uh, we relied on the permit we had. Um, now you're effectively pulling the rug out from under us. Yeah. Uh, we, we're gonna take a ter terrible loss on this. And anyone watching from the mainland, from the investment community, sees this kind of thing happening. It doesn't matter whether what the policy point is on energy, it's the policy point on investment, um, offshore investment coming to Hawaii. And if they see you know, the experience we've had, they will never invest in Hawaii. We'll lose unnamed, unnameable investments going forward because of what happened here. Similar to so many other projects, uh, like, think of the ferry, for example, that got caught up in something uh, and ended you know, with a dull sun. Uh, what's your answer to that, Marco? I'm, not I'm sympathetic to that line of uh, reasoning. Jay, in fact, you know, on the solar side, although this hasn't happened to me particular or my company, is that there have been a number of solar companies, small, medium, and large, who have pursued million, multi-million dollar projects on different islands and who have been uh, stymied for a number of reasons along the way after having spent millions and essentially being forced to, to pull out. And, you know, I'm not going to get into finger pointing in terms of is this person's fault or that utility's fault, but I mean, the principle is the same where you have outside capital, outside developers who want to do something anywhere from Manini size to big and bold and dramatic, right? And, you know, hey, you know, welcome to the real world. I mean, it's the cost of doing business. You pursue some projects, you get them, you pursue some projects, you don't get them. And I mean, who honua is trying their best, has been trying their best to try to move this, this investment forward so they'll get a payoff for their, you know, their, their reported $500 million investment or something along those lines. But I mean, I go back to a more fundamental question, Jay, which is quite simply, is a biomass burning power plant on the big island of Hawaii, part of the Hawaiian island chain in the best interest of the people of this island, in the best interest of the people of the state, in the best interest of the people of the planet? And the resounding answer to those three questions is no, no, no. Everything hmm. else falls along the wayside. I guess so at the end of the day, uh, that policy, you know, the policy of what we're doing here with renewables would, would, should prevail. It's just really regrettable that the course of action steering through the channel on this, as it were, has been so difficult for them and has resulted, or may well now in April, 22nd and thereafter result in, a, in the loss of all those. Well, and here's another twist for you, Jay. I just learned it this last week or so. So the Huonua folks apparently are still working in the Hawaii legislature. They haven't given up. And they were trying to, they're, they're working on a bill, either past or present, okay? Working on a bill where the legislature would chime in on the notion of whether burning biomass in this case, trees, right? Burning biomass, it, it, it contributes to greenhouse gases. In other is it, words- Isn't that put, a scientific fact? Uh, well, let me just finish the, the line of thinking here. So they're thinking if we could get this bill passed, if we could get the governor to sign it, maybe this is gonna be the life ring for our power plant, Huho Nua, that if somehow we could get this legislature and this governor to recognize that that carbon dioxide and other GHGs that come from burning biomass are not in the same categories, not in the same category as burning oil or burning coal. That is what they're arguing, okay? Now, there is, there is a line of argument out there that essentially you have trees that are captioning, uh, captioning, capturing CO2, right? That's, that's, what, that's what trees do amongst other things, right? So by capturing CO2, they become CO2 sinks, right? So when you release that CO2, which has been captured over time by the trees, as it goes into the atmosphere, it's essentially a net wash. That, that is my crude, maybe incorrect interpretation of the argument that maybe they can make that burning biomass is not in the same category as burning oil or burning uh, net gas or coal. But I don't buy it. I don't buy it. I don't think it's going to go anywhere in the ledge. But it just 
It's the power, James, the power of commitment and money from, in this case, this mainland group based in San Francisco, who over the years have been the most tenacious, the most persistent uh, of any developer that I've seen in my 21 years in being in the trenches out here. I've never seen any company that has just refused to say, we're done, we walk away. Look at what Nextera did. Nextera on July 15th, 2016, they got the answer from the PUC, two to nothing decision, rejecting their desire, their plan to buy Point Lake Chicken Industries. Three days later, open a business on the East Coast. On the 18th of July, next year says, we're done, we're out. So interesting contrast between one company that says, you said no, we're gone, to who all know, which is, we don't take no for an answer. We're gonna to continue to fight and to fight and to push. Interesting, huh? I'm not sympathetic to that. Uh, approach, the Puhonua approach. I, I rather like what Nextera did, and it's, it's really too bad because it, it leaves everything in the kind of in a, in a, a suspended animation while they're, they're playing their cards. This also demonstrates an incredible disparity uh, between the ordinary developer and, and the guys with the really deep pockets that, who are determined to keep on pushing no matter what. Um, even though it seems clear to me that as a scientific fact, um, this is as much carbon as the as other carbon. It reminds me of, you know, all carbon is created equal. Uh, some, some, but some carbon is more equal than other carbon. It's all carbon, man. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I like that the fact that you're channeling the the pigs in Animal Farm there with the uh, with that line. Yeah, that's just uh, I, I recognize that. Thank you. Of course. <laughs> okay, let's move on. Oh, so exciting. Uh, PGV. Um, uh, Puna, the geothermal uh, update. What's happening? Are they, they're not still they're, still, they're still stuck, right? Well, yes and no. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, so, uh, you know, PGV, Puna Geothermal Venture, was offline for more than two years. More than two years, right? From May 2018 to November, they started 2020. Okay. And now they're, they're about 20 megawatts, according to our friend Mike Calacchini, who's the general manager. They're, they're operating. They're, they're, they're operating. power to the Big Island grid. Okay, good. They're operating. They're operating under a power purchase agreement, which is now 35 years old, by my count. 35 years old, okay? A PPA that goes back to 1986 with some revisions back in, I think it was 2011, okay? So it is an old PPA. And they proposed to the commission uh, December, they submitted this December, 2019. So it's, it's a while, a revised and modified PPA that they agreed to with uh, Hawaii Electric Light Company, Elko. And that would have, it would, would, would have, it would have uh, turned the entire output of PGV into a fixed contract at a knowable price from day one to the end of the contract. Now, uh, for the first 25 megawatts, the Helco is required to pay PGV or MAT at the so-called avoided cost rate, the avoided cost rate, which is variable depending on the price of oil that Hawaiian Electric is paying for oil, right? And FYI, we burn more oil for power here than we do in the rest of the United States combined, okay? So as the price of oil goes up and goes down, it affects the avoided cost. So as the price of oil goes up, which it is on an upward swing, Helco is paying more to PGV, therefore ratepayers are paying more to PGV. So this new PPA, which was submitted December, 2019, would have removed the avoided cost aspect. So by and large, it would be beneficial to, more beneficial to ratepayers. So bring in the so commission. There was a lot of pressure for this. This, this has been something in yes. discussion since, since the uh, eruption. And, yes. um, you know, when they went down, everybody said, well, the, you know, they've been, they've been getting too much. The old PPA is paying them too much. We have to use this as a, what do you want to call it, a pivotal point um, to equalize, to, to reduce the amount that they are paid for their kilowatt hours. And, and I thought th that was the right argument at the time. They were making too much as against uh, costs in, for other, other renewables, other sources. Um, and, and I guess they acceded to that. Pressure, the pressure of that argument and the political pressure that went along with it. And I guess uh, Hawaiian Electric was happy enough um, to see that that happen because it reduces 
their cost and thus the cost to consumers. Um, but it, you know, it's, I, what I'm getting here though, is that because everybody wanted to do this and change the old rates to a new and more progressive rate for the benefit of the people, that triggered the EIS. Oh my God, that triggered the EIS. So, you know, it, it, I'm sure they, um, they re regret it at some level. <laughs> Well, Jay, there were a number of parties, including uh, your former uh, host, one of your former hosts, Senator Russell Ruderman, now former Senator Russell Ruderman, still a very good friend of mine and business owner here, who's been living in Pune for, for decades. Russell and a number of other parties in Pune essentially challenged, I've been challenging PGV in terms of safety and emissions and the possibility of a runaway uh, leak, essentially a blowout for, for years and years, right? So they said, look, uh, you know, the last EIR, Environmental Impact Report, is decades and decades old. There needs to be a new one. There needs to be a new one. And effectively, the commission said there needs to be a new one. There needs to be a new EIR. There needs to be an accepting agency who's going to perform the EIR, whether it's DLNR, Department of Land and Natural Resources, or some other agency. There needs to be a new EIR. And in the meantime, we are suspending the docket uh, that would consider the new PPA. So the, the, the bottom line here is, Jay, that for the foreseeable future, the PGV will continue to operate and go up to as many as 38 megawatts. They're now about 20, uh, 20 megs. By the end of the year, Mike says they'll be up to full capacity, that their power continues to be generated and sold to Helco. So it's business as usual under- That means the, the rates are established under the old existing PPA correct. then. Correct. So the, 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 the consumers are not paying less. They're paying under that 35 year old um, the PPA. Right. Um, that, that's at least temporarily, that's not a good result. No, but it's telling to me, Jay, it's telling to me that, you know, this commission in particular with uh, our friends, Jay Griffin, Jenny Potter, Leo Astuncian, you know, from my perspective, this commission is more enviro, more green sensitive and oriented than any other commission that I've been aware of in, in the years I've been in the field. Oh, I, totally, I totally agree. That's, that's clear. There's no question about it. Every move they make is, is in that direction and, and kudos to them for it. How long is it going to take, though, to get this new uh, environmental impact report together and get it straight away, straightened away so that uh, the new PPA can be approved? Uh, well, my impression is that you can't just Google a uh, find me an EIR and, and find, you know, 10 candidates that you can call and say, would you please do one next week? I mean, uh, this is an involved process. It's a long process. Uh, you can't find them off the internet, and this is going to push things out not months, but uh, a year or longer. I could be widely off base, but that is my impression. EARs don't happen in a quick, quick, wiki, wiki uh, vacuum. No, they never so, have, and then there's you know, the <laughs> yeah, people exactly. who are going to jump on this as back in the 90s, right? And they're going to oppose geothermal in general. They're going to say that the environmental implications of having PGV in that location, uh, you know, and, peop and people have moved into Pune and, and they're closer now to PGV than they were before. Those people, now the neighbors, you know, weren't the neighbors before, now the neighbors are going to be out there uh, joining into the fray. And before you know it, there'll be opposition in general, geothermal in Hawaii. Don't you think, isn't that yeah. already happening? Well, I mean, uh, uh, there was discussions about geothermal going back to the 1980s, and uh, they talked, they talked, they talked, they talked, and finally there were protests, there were blocking of the roads, there was claims desecration of Pele, and the and the, the plan finally did go online in 1992, if I'm not mistaken, after years and years of talk, talk, years and years you know, of there protests. There was a lawsuit there by the Sierra Club in the middle 90s that stopped them all together, and they, and they kind of gave it up until... Uh, uh, Ormac uh, came around and, and bought the place and started it up again, but it was so controversial. Gee whiz, for a long time. So, I mean, there, there's no shortage, Jay, of, of people I, I like a lot. You know, dear friends, uh, whether it's Richard Haw, uh, Hank Rogers, and others here and elsewhere who are big uh, 
geothermal proponents, you know, and see the possibility. We could do so much geothermal on this island. We could supply the whole state with geothermal. Well, uh, yeah, maybe in, in concept, but you know, the, the political headwinds, the environmental headwinds of, of drilling, drilling anywhere for, for, for test bores essentially, or even passive sonar, whether it's along Saddle Road, whether it's the, the slopes of Hula Lai, whether it's Haleakala, I just see the, the correlation of forces, an old Soviet Union term, the correlation of forces against new geothermal in the state on this island, I think are so strong. Uh, I don't think any new geothermal is gonna happen in my lifetime on this island. I think there are easier, cheaper, less, uh, more benign renewable energy sources. And, and I'm not poo-pooing base load, providing base load with, with, uh, with what we have from PGV. But uh, I'm, you know, as a political scientist, I just I put my finger in the wind. I just don't see the uh, adequate support on the pro geothermal side to weather the the firestorm of of opposition. I don't see it. Some of the opposition back in the '90s was nothing short of uh, sabotage, and uh, there were death threats and the like, and a lot of people. And it was cultural. A lot of people didn't want that project to happen at all. Then it kind of died down. And they got up to 38 megawatts, uh, although they could have gone much further than that, and and uh, still could. The question I put to you though is, uh, what you know, what does this contention mean? Is it still alive? The contention is still alive, just as it was in the 90s. Um, and this is an opportunity for those who would oppose the project, who would oppose PGV in general, geothermal in general, you know, to take a whack at it in the context of the of this PUC proceeding. Um, query. And this is the question: Is P PGV here to stay, or is the end the end game on this the end of PGV? I like the way you phrase that. Uh, is PGV here to stay? I don't think their operation is threatened imminently. Uh, you know, in terms of the fact that it's been operating now for for several decades, uh, has uh, given it legitimacy, you know, that the, the sky hasn't fallen, there hasn't been toxic clouds across all of Lower Puna. And I don't wanna, you know, make light of, of the possibility of, of releases of sulfur dioxide or other nasty stuff. But I mean, uh, we've had, you know, close to 30 years worth of, of geothermal and by and large, by and large, I think it's been, it's been good. It's been an overall net positive is my view. Now that said, if there were to be uh, serious talk and efforts to have new geothermal, then I think that would probably elicit a, a ramped up uh, opposition. And you look at, and here's, here's an illustrative example, JC, whether you buy, buy this or not. For decades, we've had telescopes on Mauna Kea, right? Decades. And there's been you know, some unhappiness amongst native Hawaiians and others about the telescopes being there. I respect that. But uh, little did we know, or little did I know, that uh, it took TMT, the 30 meter telescope, to start actually being possible in terms of construction to bring about a response and opposition, a pushback that surprised the heck out of a bunch of people, including me. So here you had all these telescopes there for decades, and yet talk about building a new one. Whoa. So here, to go back to PGV, we've had PGV for decades. Talk about building a new one on Saddle Road or Hula Lai. I think that would probably bring about a very powerful counter response, similar to what we saw with or, or seeing, I've seen with uh, TMT. On the other side of it, you know, there is an argument to be made for having a diversified portfolio, and uh, that you know that seemed to be settled that uh, that geothermal was part of that portfolio. You never know uh, what what fragile fragileness um, you can find, especially in uh, the advent of uh, unpredictable weather or predictably extreme weather on any of these renewable sources. And so you like to, you know, have more than one egg in your basket. That would, you know, that would be. I would still make that argument. I would, I, I, I would still hold to the fact that we need to do diversified renewables. And this one is completely dispatchable. In other words, yeah. you don't really need batteries. It's twenty-four by seven. It's any time you want it. Um, this is there's a great value in having it. I would I would not uh, undermine it. I would I let it go. But but right now, I mean, let it operate. But right now, 
uh, I guess if nothing happens, and if it takes a long time for the EIS, EIR, um, they'll be okay. They're covered. They'll continue to operate. Well, and I'll just cite this quick stat. I mean, it was Colton Ching, senior VP at Hoyne Electric, who noted in a public forum not too long ago that with the first full year of PGV at close to 50 megawatts, which is where they could go under a new PPA, okay? 48 megawatts, I think. First full year at a uh, enlarged PGV, Hawaii Electric Light Company could be somewhere around, would be somewhere around 80%, okay? 80% renewable in its generation, 80%. And which would put us on par with Kauai, where, where, where Kauai and, and Dave Bisla, KIUC are going to be within a short amount of time. So, you know, as someone who's been living and breathing renewable energy for more than 40 years, I don't take that lightly. I think that's, that's very, you know, that's very impressive. And that, you know, the higher percentages we hit sooner, the more better we're going to be. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I'm not, I'm, 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 I'm of a mixed mind and mixed Marco mind on. On, on geothermal. Triple M, yeah, triple M. Uh, let me add one other point is if they go down because of uh, you know objections and protests, uh, and which would be rooted largely as they have been all these years in, in cultural consideration, you have another super fairy kind of result where Wall Street says, that, you know, we let these guys, um, you know, hundreds of millions to beef it up and fix it up after the eruption. And now we've lost that. Um, Hawaii is not the kind of place you want to invest your money, even if it seems to be a worthy impact investment, because it's so unpredictable in terms of the regulatory and uh, community response kind of process. I mean, look, look at, we can talk about TMT some other time, but there's a good example there. Anyway, last item, but today anyway, the AES coal plant retirement supposed to be September 22nd, and how, and how tight the reserve margin will be. This was uh, discussed at the PUC meeting at which uh, Hawaiian Electric um, uh, showed up. Colton Shing was there, and, and that, was, uh, that was the subject of our last discussion with Jay Griffin. So um, you know, what's, the, what's the status of that? Well, uh, as uh, uh, Scott Glenn, head of the State Energy Office, noted during our, our talk two weeks ago, I mean, lo and behold, the governor has established a task force to uh, watch over such things, right? So not only do we have the Public Utilities Commission, now we have a task force appointed by the governor to uh, watch over uh, what's going over, what's going on, which will be going on, uh, especially on Oahu. So there are a lot of eyes on what's going on. <laughs> here and there's a lot of concern and you know in Colton's own own, own words uh, a tight margin a tight reserve margin is anticipated when AES goes down so it's kind of um, you know uh, in naval terms and uh, you're more familiar with the naval terms than I am it, it is a uh, it is an all hands on deck right and it, it's going to be uh, you know work unfolding now there are a number of uh, I think it was two of the uh, larger utility scale uh, stage one or phase one PV plus storage, uh, we're both pressed by the commission, by Helco or Hawaiian Electric as well. Can you meet, can you, can you speed up your schedule? Can you go online sooner than you originally told us? And I think two of them said, yes, it could by a few months. So maybe it's a lot of, you know, henny penny, the sky is gonna fall, you know, too much hand wringing right now. But at the same time, you know, the thought of, uh, you know, to use Jay Griffin's language, the thought of kids having coal in their stockings and dark houses uh, in Christmas time, 2022, you know, got his attention, right? Got his and Jay and Leo's attention and, you know, ringing the alarm bell. So, you know, it, it's, nobody knows for sure, Jay. What we do know is that large power plant is gonna go offline sometime in September. And, you know, there has to be something to back it up, uh, whether it's a battery, an expensive battery that's going to be charged by fossil fuels, which you know it's clear that uh, Jay and Jenny and Leo do not like that idea whatsoever. So you know it's the grand experiment unfolding, and one of the things the utility operators do not like is to have a tight reserve margin. That's less room for error, right? And you know the the doomsday stuff for them is the grid goes down, rolling blackouts, system wide shutdown, 
And, you know, we don't need to look any farther than ERCOT in Texas, which was calamitous after, after the freeze that they had. And now they're lawsuits galore and, you know, these humongous utility bills that are going to push people into insolvency and so oh, forth. Yeah, so, there's real risk here. There's real risk. Yeah. Yeah, there but, is. But you know, it's a, I think the position taken by Jay and the, and the PUC in general is right. It's correct because that plant will close. That's a statute. It's a statute requiring it to close. So you really have to prepare for that. And uh, there are demands that, you know, that, that there be robust preparations. That's a good thing. And their act in bringing the Scott Glenn and the energy office in, that was a good thing. And for that matter, theoretically anyway, the task force, creation of the task force is a good thing. I just hope that it doesn't you know, go the way so many task forces you and I have seen go, which is yeah. you know, in, onto the dusty shelf somewhere. Um, we should follow it, Marco. We should take a look at it and see uh, that, that it's happening because it, uh, otherwise, it's, to me, it's too great a risk. If you have a tight reserve margin, you're, you have a much greater risk. And, we don't want Texas. We do not want Texas. Am I right? <laughs> well, considering my my beloved paternal grandmother was the Texas Bell from uh, Amarillo and Lubbock, uh, I don't want to be too down, you know, on the uh, the Lone Star State because I got some Texas twang and some Texas blood in me, brother. So, but we do not want to be Texas in terms of what happened with their uh, utility company or their their uh, uh, the company that oversaw. The utilities within uh, the the geographical confines of the Great Lone Star State. No, we don't want to go in that direction. Okay, I I, uh, I think we're probably out of time here. We have to leave it. Uh, thank you very much, Marco. You've been watching Energy 808, the Cutting Edge in Tech Hawaii. We've been discussing the Aloha State Energy Roundup with Marco Langostor. Um, thanks to our viewers for watching. I'm Jay Fidel. We'll be back in two weeks with another edition of. Energy 808 to cutting edge. Aloha and thanks. Round them up, little doggies. Thank you, Jay. <laughs> Always a pleasure.